So worship just doesn't happen during the music. It happens as we open up God's word and begin to pick it apart and apply it to our lives, right? Everybody doing okay today? Yeah. Well, you look good, okay? You look good. As you walked in here, I saw your smiling faces. I love that. I love being together in church. Always thankful. Never take it for granted, right? Never take it for granted of what God can do in and through community. And so we are blessed uh, to have you guys. My name is Daniel Kaznave. I'm the pastor here at the Bridge Church. And it is an honor and a privilege to be the pastor here. But also it's a, a, even a higher calling. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to open up God's word every single week. And just to dive into it and to teach it and to be a part of that as well. And we started a series last week called... Letting go. Very good. Letting go. So we, we are asking this question, what is holding me back? And we have been studying Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, we see uh, that the Apostle Paul, he is teaching and he is saying, I forget what is behind me and I press towards the future. I press towards what is in front of me. And so last week we talked about what is he talking about when he says I press forward towards in front of me. What's the goal? What are we leaning into as Christians? Uh, but there's, the, uh, there's a big piece, right? Because the Apostle Paul stops and he says, I forget. And he uses this word neglect in the original Greek. We see it says to almost to not think about, to let go, right? And he's saying there's this pivotal piece. And I don't know, uh, is there, are there any people in the house who love the Olympics? Uh, I love when the Olympics come on. I don't necessarily know every sport. All of a sudden I'm watching like cricket and all these like crazy sports, but it's the Olympics and you got to watch it and you got to cheer them on. And I, I love watching the Olympics just because it's so fun to see the competitive nature and all the different countries represented. And uh, there's a particular uh, event, track and field, right? And in track and field, if you don't know, uh, there is this competition called the relay. And that's where you have four different people and they have a moment of transition. And if you've never been a part of track and field before, uh, you, what, what you maybe didn't know is, is that moment of transition is one of the most important parts of the race. And so you could be the fastest team on the track, but can lose the race in that moment of transition. If that transition is not right, where I'm, I'm ha passing off the baton, if that, that motion is not correct, then you could almost, you could lose the race, but you could also be disqualified if you drop that baton, right? So it's an incredibly important. And you know, to master that, you have to know exactly when to, uh, when you have the baton, that person has to know exactly when to what? Let go of it, right? And the next person has to know when to grab it. If that's too early if I let go or if I release it and we mess that up, then the entire race is being stopped, right? So that's incredibly important. But for you and I, as we think about life, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about this same transition in life. He's saying when we step into our relationship with Christ, there is a there's an opportunity for you and an opportunity for me where he is saying we have to release some things when we come to know Christ, right, in order to press forward because I can't fully press forward until I've really released what is behind me. And I remember reading that verse in Philippians chapter 3. And I remember thinking like, well, God, what are all of those things that you call us to release, to let go, right? And because it, if you read that verse, it's a big deal. If it's going to stop me from growing in my maturity in Christ, then I need to know, God, I want to know all of those things that you're calling me to release so I can fully pursue you in everything that we have. And so for me, as we open up God's word, I don't like to spill truth like that and then go, hey, just take it, you know, take it for granted, right? Like take it off of just believe what I have to say. I like to prove it in scripture, okay? So we're going to look at this verse here that we ended with last week in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is an incredible, beautiful piece of scripture because we're coming off of Hebrews chapter 11, which uh, we a lot of people call the uh, wall of faith, where we see all of these people in scripture who had incredible faith that were called out by name. And then we see here in Hebrews chapter 12, and this is what he says. Therefore, so take in an account of Hebrews chapter 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. 
And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. We see this. He's saying, hey, we have a race. We have a goal that we are pressing towards. And he's saying, lay aside, strip away. Get rid of, let go all the, everything that slows us down. And I like how he even uh, classifies it, right? He says, let go of everything that so easily entangles and especially the sin, right? So he even says there's sin that we need to let go of. And then there's things that uh, maybe are, maybe are uh, allowed in Scripture, but for us in our season, we need to let go of. Right? Maybe there's something in, the, in our season of life that God is going, hey, this is not necessarily fully against Scripture, but right now in your season, what God is trying to do, what I'm trying to heal in you, I want you to let go of that for a season. I want you to let go of that for a moment. Right? Like maybe uh, just for a simple, quick example, maybe I'm trying to create a better habit of being in God's Word. And God goes, you know what? Right now, delete Netflix. Let go of that for right now, right? Like everybody in the room was like, that is crazy, right? Like, but, but maybe just from that moment of saying, God's not saying, hey, uh, Netflix is all, or whatever you're watching on TV or TV, whatever it is, is bad, right? Or stop watching that. He just said, for a season, I want you to let go of this so that you can lean into what I have for you. You can find this growth. But then he says, especially, right? He, hi he highlights or Mark says, especially the sin that so easily entangles and trips up our lives. And so if we look at this, we ask the question, what is that sin that God asked us to let go of? Why is it so important? And if it's so important, God, I need to know. I need to know specifically what I need to let go of. And God is so good. He just doesn't leave us to guess, right? He doesn't leave a guessing game. He creates clarity in Scripture. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And the last few verses here in chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul is writing this. I, I love the Apostle Paul and his heart for the gospel and how God uh, used him to write majority of the New Testament. And we see him, uh, and I would even argue that maybe we see him in Hebrews. Some people don't believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. We don't necessarily know who wrote Hebrews, but uh, we see some of his uh, penship that may could happen in there. But then in Ephesians, we know that Paul wrote Ephesians. And as he's writing to the Ephesian church, he is uh, showing this picture of the gospel. And he spends the first two chapters really leaning into a new life in Christ. And then he spends the last part of Ephesians of going, this is what the gospel looks like in real life. This is what the gospel looks like in the church in Ephesians chapter 4. And then he says, hey, this is what the gospel looks like in family and marriage in Hebrews, I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, right? And then he even says, hey, be ready for spiritual battle and begins to describe all of this. But in the last few verses, he gives us some practical advice and even names some things that God is asking us to let go of. You guys still all right? Still good? All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says this. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of, here it is, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted. That word means compassionate. Tenderhearted, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. He says here, he begins to describe, and verse 30 is important because in our relationship with God, he is saying if we don't get rid of these things, then we can grieve the Holy Spirit, right? The, that God is dwelling in us and we can grieve, we can bring sorrow to God living in us. He is saying, hey, now you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. A holy God dwells in you and God begins to do a holy work in us, transforming us into the image of Christ all throughout our lives as we grow closer to Christ, right? And he is saying, I'm going to start molding and shaping you. And so there's going to be things that I'm calling you to, right? Towards righteousness, but then there's also going to be things that I want to chisel away, right? 
And he begins to name some of these. He's saying, if we lean into these, then it's going to cause the grieving of the Holy Spirit. But if we let these go and pursue righteousness, we see God begin to do a mighty work in us and to move us towards spiritual maturity. But I'm going to read this real quickly again. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And we look at that and we may see all of these different things that God calls us to let go of. But this last piece can become a cascading waterfall for you and I. Forgiving one another. Be kind to one another. Be compassionate to one another. But then he gives this huge that we cannot miss. This huge prerequisite, right? He says, just as God through Christ has forgiven you, right? And we, I, I love how scriptures all tied together because in Ephesians, I mean, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. We do this by what? Keeping our eyes on who? Jesus. And then in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, he says, what I want you to see is that you forgive the way that Jesus forgave us. And that's what he means. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the standard in which we live our lives. He is the standard in which we forgive. And he is the standard in which how we are kind to each other and all of these different aspects, right? He says, look to Jesus. And the reason we forgive is because Christ first forgave us. But I, look, I think about that in my life and I think about uh, how I can hold on to some of those things. But every time I feel the weight of holding on to unforgiveness, God takes me back to the gospel, takes me back to Jesus of going, hey, remember where you were when Christ first forgave you. The Bible says that no one is perfect, right? We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he says, hey, that for the wages of sin is death. And while we were still sinners, right? While we were still separated from God, while we were still missing the mark, Christ died for us. That he took that first step and he offered the free gift of grace, forgiveness on the table for you and I. For, so for you, for us to understand when I enter into that initial relationship with God, I receive forgiveness that I did not deserve, Right? I received from get forgiveness from God that he opened up the doorway and that he initiated. And I want to give us uh, three steps here uh, for accepting forgiveness, because this is big. Uh, it's hard for you and I to extend forgiveness if we've never received it for ourselves. And I would even argue it's hard for you and I to forgive someone else if we haven't forgiven ourselves. If we're still holding on to some of our past and we, we keep bringing it up to God and going, God, I can't do this because I, I did this. God, you saw what I You know what I did in my childhood. You know what I did in my teenage years. You know what I did last week, God. You, you can't do that work in me. And God is going, hey, there's some things you need to let go of that you need to believe my word when I say you are forgiven. For that right and we we look at this and i want to give us three steps you guys ready i'm excited if you can't tell so here we go here we go the first step is we see that god calls us to confession and repentance confession and repentance and, and some would even argue that com true confession is repentance but i put them in there together uh, because you and i know there can be a time in our life when we confess something but repentance is bigger repentance in the bible means i take a 180 i turn away from the lifestyle or the sin or whatever it is and i turn towards god i'm changing my heart i'm changing my life that's true repentance right and so if i'm not just confessing it but it's also a heart change. We see in uh, Romans chapter 10, it says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, right? That there's a heart change with it as well. And so if I'm truly seeking forgiveness, I have the confession, but I also have the repentance of going, God, I've already tried it a hundred different ways that's outside of you and it is not filling me. It is not happening, God. And I realize I am broken. I'm realizing I'm separated from you, God. And I need you to forgive me. I need you to help me, God. I need you, Jesus. And until we get to that moment, 
It's because we don't realize we need a savior. We need someone to save us. We need someone to change us. And, and the Bible is very clear. I love this in Acts chapter 5. It says this. This is of Peter. He begins to preach to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on the cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as a prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We see this over and over in scripture of, of repentance and then forgiveness. This is big. Y'all, y'all remember this. Keep it in your minds, okay? Because we're going to get there again as we talk about other parts of forgiveness. And then number two is we have to receive God's forgiveness, right? He puts the free gift for us on the table. I have my little Yeti cup here on the counter, right? It's a free gift and you can come up. Just kidding. Don't come take my Yeti cup, okay? But you can come up, and, but you and I have to receive it, right? We have to say, God, I need you I need that and I am receiving that free gift that God has given us and the Bible says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and that is truth right we have to believe that that I can bring my sins my shortcomings everything that I have done and I can cast them at the feet of Jesus and I can walk away with the forgiveness of God I can walk away changed by the blood of Christ right that's why we hear Alan out here shouting right that's why we celebrate when we're singing because we have been forgiven from everything in our past right and we can bring that to the feet of Jesus and I can leave the altar. Oh, come to the altar as Jacob was singing. I can leave the altar knowing that Christ has forgiven me. That I can stand before God one day in heaven and say, God, it's not because of me, but because of Jesus, right? And Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And we enter into heaven because of what Jesus has done, because we have received that, right? And then the last part is, and this is where we begin to see the shift happen in our lives, is that when we, that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. We can't receive this undeserved, incredible, faithful, amazing gift of undeserved forgiveness from God. And then if we take it and we go, no, this is just for me, right? Like this is just mine. I'm going to hold on to it. This is for nobody else. God, I don't know. This is just forgiveness just for me, right? And God's going, hold on a second. I want to use you as my messenger. I want to get it through you so that other people can experience this peace, can experience this freedom, can experience this hope in Christ. And here's the thing. I don't know if maybe you've seen this before, but a professor comes up uh, in front of the class and he begins to ask everybody in the class, hey, uh, how heavy is this glass of water? I have coffee because, you know, this anyway, um, we have this coffee here. How heavy is this? glass of coffee and people begin to guess right like oh maybe it's like half a pound or whatever it is they start to name off all of these different pieces but the trick is as human beings the longer I hold this the heavier it gets right the longer I it doesn't matter what the weight is I could be the strongest man on the planet but if I'm holding on to this for more than an hour my hand starts cramping my elbows start shaking my, my shoulders hurting my neck muscles like it just starts to creep all in because I'm holding on to it for so long and I believe that there are some of us that are holding on to unforgiveness in our lives and the longer we hold on to it the heavier it begins to get. And that is why God is saying, I need you to let this go because it's holding you back from experiencing the full life in Christ. It's holding you back from not only experiencing the full life in Christ, but a part of that is helping others to see the love of Christ in And through you, he's saying, I want you to experience the supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. But if there is unforgiveness that you are holding on to, it's hard for you to experience it. Right. Because you think about whatever it is that you're holding on to. And as soon as that comes to your mind, what happens? Everything that he just labels begins to happen. Right. It says, let go of what? All bitterness, rage, 
anger, harsh words, slander, all types of evil behavior. Do you notice all of those are usually a product of holding on to unforgiveness? I remember what they did. Now I'm angry. I remember what they did. Here's all these harsh words that I have for them. I remember what happened in this situation and evil behavior. I want revenge, right? Like I want something bad to happen to them, right? Like we're holding on to this, right? Like, and we experience all of these rage, slander. You slandered my name. I'm about to slander your name, right? All of these begin. Have you noticed everything I just listed? Everything I just said. Who's controlling us now? God or that person or situation? God is saying, I don't want you to be controlled by anybody other than me. I don't want you to be controlled by any other situation. I want you to be willing to let go so that you can experience true freedom, that you can walk forward in faith and in Christ so that you are not harboring all of these things. And not only that, then I can begin to use you right to full capacity in Christ. And I'm reminded of this story and I feel like we need this real life example, right? Because there are evil things that happen in this world and to us, right? And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to stand up here and say it's the easiest thing you'll ever do in your life. No, God is saying, if you trust me and you're willing to let go of that, I will give you strength. I will give you comfort through it. We may have to revisit it again on another day and I got to let go of it again. Right. And that's the problem with a living sacrifice. It just it wants to climb off the altar. Right. We got to keep bringing that thing back before God and going, God, this yeah, I'm releasing this again today. I felt those feelings again. I felt those emotions again. These things are not of you and I need to let go of it again. I'm trusting you with it right here in this moment and I I begin to think about in scripture and there is this incredible example of somebody who was willing to let go and let's see how God used them and in the old testament there was this man named Joseph And Joseph was a young boy. He was actually one of 12. Can you imagine like 12 kids? But he was one of 12. And he had this dream one day that his his brothers and his dad would bow down to him. And he goes about boasting about this dream. I don't recommend it for building relationships, right? Like, but he's boasting about this dream. He's trying to tell them about it. And they get upset. And his dad actually does favor him a little bit. And that's a long story we can't get into today. Uh, But his, his brothers end up hating him. Like hating him so much so that they throw him into the pit and they, they talk each other out of literally letting him die, killing him. And then instead they sell him off to a, a group of people who are coming through. So basically they're selling him off into slavery and they go back and they take his beautiful coat of many colors. If you've heard of that before, and they dip it in animal's blood and they take it back to his dad and say, hey, uh, your son, he's dead. He's gone. He's no longer here. Right. Can you imagine? I mean, think about all of this that's going on. So Joseph sold into slavery in prison. God begins to do a mighty work. He starts to move up wherever he's uh, held in captivity there in Egypt. And then as he moves up, um, he experiences uh, where he gets into the palace, right? He finally works his way up. I say he works his way up. God begins to open up doorways and use his situations, use his shortcomings, use what happened to him in his life, right? And God begins to open up and he moves up all the way to the palace, right? He's doing good. I mean, this is nice. This is great. He's all the way up in the palace. He's got new clothes on. He's got some leadership, uh, all of these special abilities, right? And then something happens. The Potiphar wife notices Joseph, and Potiphar is the ruler of the time. And she starts to get a special eye for Joseph. He's young. He's handsome. And all of a sudden, she decides that she wants him, right? And so she comes on to him. She tries to convince him to to be with her, right? And then Joseph, being the godly man that he is, the Bible describes that he flees and runs from that situation. And she gets so upset that she was rejected. She cries wolf and says, hey, he tried to come on to me. He tried to to do this to me, right? And the Potiphar, of course, gets upset and does what? Throws him right back into prison. Could you imagine being Joseph going, God, I was... I was just there and I was you you open up these doorways and now this happened. I was wrongfully accused and here I am back in prison. This is crazy, God. Like, why me? Right. All these natural questions that we would ask. But Joseph begins to do a work. 
And all of a sudden we see that God opens up doorways again. Because that's the kind of God we serve. He continues to move. He continues to work. And then we see that he moves up all the way into Egypt again and becomes the second in command. So much so where God gives him a special ability to interpret dreams and uh, kind of prophesy into the future. And he sets up this incredible uh, uh, plan for food because a famine is coming and all of this. And then guess who comes strolling into Egypt again, needing food from Joseph? You guessed it, his brother's. His brothers come and here he is face to face with people who betrayed him, who left him for dead, who I'm talking about tried to kill him. I mean, think about all the emotions that are going through his mind. And he is second in command. He could speak it and they could be gone, right? He could speak it. They could be eliminated here in this moment. But he, we have this special conversation that Joseph has with his brothers. And it's going to blow you away here in Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to read it to you. Everybody still doing okay? Very good. It's verse 17. It says, to, to say to you, and so... We see his brothers, they, they finally recognize that Joseph is who he is, his brother, and they're terrified. They think he's going to take revenge, as, right? Like some naturally would think. But then they have this conversation. It says, to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you. For their sin is treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of God, of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. This is big. I want you to pay attention to some of the things that they're talking about here. For you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. I love how the Bible doesn't hide things like this. the, The real emotions that happen in life. Then his brothers came and threw himself down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, you guys ready for this? Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Joseph is using things that Ephesians 4, thousands of years later, describes to us, right? He lets go of all of those things because he's willing to forgive his brothers. But the reason he's willing to forgive his brothers is that he understands the principle that God is going to work it out for good. He understands that his God is faithful and that God is working even in the troubles and the hardships of my life, even in the betrayals and the setbacks. And when people don't deserve it, God will still continue to work. And God is the only one who can take what people and the enemy meant for bad and evil and turn it into good. Because that's the kind of savior he is. He takes a cross, an instrument for execution, and he turns it into a symbol of freedom, right? He takes every Everything that happens in our past. And he is saying, if you're willing to let go and lay it at my feet, I will begin to do a work not only in you, but through you so that other people can experience that kind of freedom as well. And we see this. You may think, well, where is this principle in the New Testament? We see in Romans 8, 28, it says and we know that God causes everything. You know what that means in Greek? Everything, right? To work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We let go, right, of that that unforgiveness of God. I'm letting go of this and I'm taking hold. I'm clinging to this principle, this truth that's in your word of going, you will work it out. I don't know how. I don't know how people can explain it to me, but I believe you are going to work it out and I may not see it. I mean, this was multiple years over Joseph's life where he he didn't no, he didn't know how this was all going to play out, but he just kept clinging to the truth that my God will work this out. I'm going to keep letting this go and I'm going to keep pursuing God and what it has for me. Now, I want to point out a couple things as we get ready to close here, because we once we receive God's forgiveness, right now, God says, I want you to do the same for those who are around you. 
But if we're honest, that's a little tricky, right? That's a little, it's a little different. And, and for us, God, how, how does this play out? What does this look like for my life? And remember, I, I talked about the three steps, right? Confession, repentance, receive the forgiveness. Now I can forgive those who have forgiven me. And I want to show you two different almost routes, both of them leading towards forgiveness. But maybe the overall reconciling relationship plays out a little differently in a couple of different scenarios. And we see here... That, that his brothers, what were they? They were repentant, right? They came, they had this confession and repentance. They were, they were literally laying at Joseph's feet going, I can't believe this. And, and if you want to go back and read the story, Joseph even tests their repentance. He puts some things in their bag to see if they'll still lie again. And he goes through this whole process of checking if they're truly repentant, right? Because repentance brings about what? Life change. My heart has changed. I have changed, right? And so now let's move forward on not only giving you forgiveness, but also 